APCO Educational Topic Number 14, Lactation. Welcome to the APCO Promotion of Breastfeeding Celebration. I am Leche Lactation, your MC for this evening. Breast milk is the preferred source of nutrition for infants and babies. The World Health Organization, UNICEF, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and the American Academy of Pediatrics all recommend inclusive breastfeeding for at least six months. Come join us for this exciting celebration of breastfeeding. The objectives of this video are to list the normal physiologic and anatomic changes of the breast during pregnancy and postpartum, recognize and know how to treat common postpartum abnormalities of the breast, list the benefits of breastfeeding, describe the resources and approaches to determining medication safety in breastfeeding, and lastly, describe common challenges in the initiation and maintenance of breastfeeding. Let's start this discussion with some sombering statistics. According to the Centers for Disease Control, approximately 79% of new moms initiate breastfeeding. At six months, this number has gone down to 49%, and at one year, only 27% are continuing to breastfeed. For black women, at six months, only 17% are breastfeeding, and at one year, 6% are continuing to breastfeed. For Hispanic women, the rates are 35% breastfeeding at six months and 18% breastfeeding at one year. Throughout this video, it is important to consider why so many women in the United States choose not to breastfeed and how we can improve these numbers. Let's start with a review of breast anatomy. Here is a non-pregnant breast with the areola. Each breast contains 12 to 20 lobules, which are also called mammary glands, which have grape-like clusters of cells called alveoli. The lobules are connected to the areola by lactiferous ducts. Myoepithelial cells lie in the lobules and the alveoli. These are the myoepithelial cells. During pregnancy, the areola darkens. This enables the baby to be able to see it better. And breast tissue is stimulated by estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is primarily responsible for growth of the lobules, so they get bigger, while progesterone stimulates alveolar hypertrophy. So here we have more alveoli. Breast size increases in size by 25 to 50 percent during pregnancy due to this growth as well as to increased blood flow and increased adipose tissue. After delivery, estrogen and progesterone levels fall and prolactin and oxytocin levels are high. Prolactin leads to milk production and oxytocin stimulates the myoepithelial cells to squeeze the milk out of the ducts. Breast milk is ideal nutrition for babies. It is easy to digest and is perfectly formulated for most healthy babies. There are also important immunologic benefits of breast milk. Babies who drink breast milk have decreased incidence of otitis, respiratory infections, diarrheal illnesses, allergic and atopic diseases. There are maternal benefits as well. Breastfeeding may enhance post-pregnancy weight loss. There are also long-term decreased risks of both breast and ovarian cancer for women who breastfeed. While breastfeeding is natural, it can be very challenging for many women. Reasons for early termination within the first months of breastfeeding include sore nipples, concerns of inadequate milk supply, and concerns that their infant had difficulty with breastfeeding. Remember that breast milk does not come in until 48 to 72 hours after the delivery. Colostrum is full of lymphocytes and IgA, IgG, and IgM. It is very important that the woman have the infant latch every two to three hours in order to stimulate milk production. Milk production runs on the supply and demand rule. The more the breasts are stimulated, the more milk will be produced. Many women are often concerned that they are not making enough colostrum or milk for their infants. A general rule is that for the first few weeks of life, a baby should feed 8 to 12 times per day. Yes, that works out to every 2 to 3 hours. By day 5 of life, a baby should make 6 to 8 wet diapers per day and 3 to 5 stools per day. If a baby is not reaching these goals, it could be due to inadequate milk supply or poor milk extraction. It is important to recognize triage and treat the common postpartum abnormalities of breastfeeding. Let's introduce our patient testimonials. This is Sally Engorgement. She is a 27-year-old Gravita 1 Para 1 who gave birth four days ago and has been breastfeeding her new baby every two to three hours. My breasts are swollen, very sore, and I have a temp of 100.0. Breast engorgement can be very uncomfortable and Sally should be encouraged to continue breastfeeding and to use over-the-counter analgesia for the pain. Our next patient is Molly Mastitis. She's a 30-year-old Gravita 2 Para 2 and has developed very high fevers up to 103 degrees, myalgias, and left breast pain. The baby won't latch well on the left nipple, and now there is a red spot, and it is very painful. Let's discuss what happens when there is mastitis. 
When there is an impediment to forward flow of breast milk, it backs up into the breast tissue, and this becomes a nidus for infection. The impediment is often a galactoseal or plug duct. When a patient has erythema and fevers, then she has the diagnosis of mastitis and needs antibiotics. The first line treatment is dicloxacillin, which will cover the most common organism of Staph aureus. It is also essential to emphasize the importance of encouraging forward flow with aggressive feeding and or pumping on the affected breast. Our next patient is Yolanda Yeast. She's a 35-year-old Gravita 3 para 2 who has been exclusively breastfeeding since delivery and had no problems until a couple of days ago. My nipple is very itchy and red, and now my baby has white spots in its mouth. Yolanda Yeast and her baby now both have candidal infections or thrush and should both be treated with antifungal medications. Our last patient is Don't to Give Formula, a Gravita 2 para 1 at 38 weeks in clinic for a prenatal appointment. She fed her first child formula. My mother-in-law told me to use formula until my milk came in. No, mother-in-law, no. Many women make this mistake of not realizing the importance of the colostrum and the importance of frequent feedings in order to stimulate breast milk production. Note that if a baby's pediatrician recommends supplementation, then this recommendation needs to be followed, but there are ways to do this that will not create nipple confusion for the baby. Are there any contraindications to breastfeeding? There are very few. There are infectious contraindications in developed countries. Women with HIV or an active hepatitis B or TB infection should not breastfeed. In developing countries, the same recommendation holds true if safe alternatives to breast milk are available. It is important to note that in developing countries, breastfeeding may be better even in the presence of infectious diseases because it outweighs the risks of contaminated water supply and diseases. A second infectious breastfeeding contraindication is an active herpetic breast lesion. And lastly, galactosemia. Infants born with this rare metabolic disorder should not be breastfed. Screening for galactosemia is performed at the time of the newborn screen. What about medications? Most therapeutic drugs are considered safe for breastfeeding. The National Institutes of Health has developed a website and app called LactMed that provides information about individual medication safety during breastfeeding. This concludes the APCO promotion of breastfeeding celebration. We have reviewed the normal physiologic and anatomic changes of the breast during pregnancy and the postpartum, how to recognize and treat common postpartum abnormalities, the benefits of breastfeeding, the resources and approach to determining medication safety, and common challenges in the initiation and maintenance of breastfeeding. Mm -hmm.